Hi, I'm Sheila Kuehl. Welcome to Get Used to It, our monthly show about issues of interest to the lesbian gay community. And as you may know, if you've been watching the show for three years or so, every so often we have an interview with a person that uh, a lot of people know but may not know as well as they'd like to. And so we do a one-on-one -on -one interview for a whole hour. And today we're very fortunate to have with us Elizabeth Birch, who is the executive director of the Human Rights Campaign which, as I'm sure you know, is our movement's lobbying arm in Congress and also does uh, a lot of wonderful work in the states on uh, the initiatives, et cetera. And you'll hear a lot about that, but even more about Elizabeth. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. Glad that you could be in LA so that we could snag you this uh, early Sunday morning. <laughs> I bet they don't know that we're up bright and early here. And it's even earlier for you, right? It is, and I'm delighted to be here. And I love that you have the time to do this in addition to being the greatest openly gay <laughs> representative um, in the state of California. And so, the only openly gay representative in the state of California. That's so true. Actually, that's a pearl. I appreciate it anyway. It's true. But this is, uh, this is one in an occasional series, as I, as I indicated at mm -hmm. the beginning. And uh, one of the things that we rarely get to do, I think, with our heroes and sheroes is to have the time to hear kind of how they got where they are. Mm -hmm. And I know, since I know you, that you're uh, an introspective kind of person and, uh, and know a lot about how your life hangs together. So I wondered if you would share with us kind of where you grew up and especially the, the first sense that you had that you might be a lesbian. I know mm -hmm. it was pretty early in your life. Mm -hmm. Well, I was, um, you know, a person that was born in the United States, um, but I grew up outside of the United States. And I think that a number of factors have really um, influenced my, my upbringing and, and the way I came, uh, came of age um, as a lesbian. You know, I, I was very acutely aware at a very, very young age. Um, probably around the age of seven or eight that I was very different, very special. By the time I was 12, um, I was, could articulate that I was a lesbian. Um, and my friends were somewhat mystified by not only the fact that I would utter the word, but that I just thought it was the greatest thing on the face of the earth. I literally thought that it was this incredible variation on the species and that I got to carry these sacred seeds. So were you in some fantastic country where this was a great thing to be unlike every other country in the world or <laughs> how how did you escape that that the sense of disapproval about this very awful thing to be that that most people grow up with? Um, where I was is I grew up all over Canada and uh, I think that what saved me and I think what saved a number of um, women. I mean, it was still a rare experience to sort of understand um, how special it was to be a lesbian. But I came of age you know, in my early teens right in the middle of the emergence, I mean, the heyday of the second wave of feminism. Um, and if you know, you know this intimately that um, the women's movement. Although there was a lot of um, wedge driving and a lot of ordering of, of lesbians out of now and a lot of disassociation sort of at the formal level um, in terms of lesbians, I mean, you know that there was this very potent sort of celebration of what it was to be a woman in the middle of all that. And through a 12-year-old's eyes, um, I had already been absolutely obsessed with British feminism because in Canada we didn't really look south. Uh, you know, we saw, we saw the sort of uh, the, the movement in the United States as sort of liberal, but we looked really to Britain and the turn of the century and we got our inspiration from people like the Pankhurst. And, and I told you once that, you know, I really thought I have got to spend my life with Christabel Pankhurst, even though she'd been <laughs> dead for, you know, 60 years at that point. So I think there was a way in which to understand my sexuality in that context um, really fortified me and gave me a lot of strength. I also was acutely aware as a young woman that, and I credit my lesbianism 
with understanding so young that I would have to be my own provider. I would never uh, be able to depend on anybody. And I think that it caused me to make a number of, and if you look at my life in perfect parallel, you see very mainstream traditional choices right beside kind of organic activism. Well, you have a line that you use about yourself, about your, and I, I you could say it, I can't really remember about having an activist heart. I always say I'm, I'm more or less, to sum it up, I have a very vibrant activist heart, but when it comes down to it, I'm a capitalist tool. <laughs> and it's true. I mean, I've made very conventional choices. I, um, I, eventually was an oceanography major, did a lot of science. It was a dual major with political science as well. But you know, I became a lawyer. I went to one of the oldest firms in the country, a 125 year, year old firm. Um, I went on to be an executive at a Fortune 100 company. I mean, how conventional um, can you get? And yet in every single setting, I was out. And not only out, I saw it as a competitive advantage. Uh, to be a lesbian. Um, but was it a competitive advantage to that 12-year-old who was so certain? I mean, you must have grown up either fiercely uh, independent by virtue of needing to be out of your family or else incredibly supported by your family because this kind of confidence that early, it's very unusual. I was, I had enormous conviction as a young woman, but it was the latter scenario. I. I almost hovered above myself um, when I was small and there was some wise old woman living in me that looked down and said this kid is going to suffer developmentally through the teenage years if there is not a well-honed escape plan um, and I spent I was very conventionally successful, good student, president, but unconventional in, in the execution. Well, if you were out, I mean. Well, I was, I was out only at the latter part of high school. I would talk very intimately to my friends, but in terms of institutional being out, it was the very end of high school and then my escape. And by the time I was 16, I had left home. And it, I left home in a very unconventional way. I was a rabid feminist. I was very progressive in my political analysis. And one day, this shiny group of young people came swooping into my small town in Canada. And I, they, I would not let them. They looked like the frosted mini weeds. <laughs> um, but I had this sense that, oh my god, these are my people. They're gay. And I wouldn't let them perform at my high school because I was too hip. I mean, we were doing things like running um, folk concerts for Bangladesh and doing big rock concerts. And who and was it, this group? It turned out it was up with people. Oh, I see the the, and uh, uh, the frosted mini wheats. I get exactly. it exactly. And these people. Um, ended up being really, uh, th that organization ended up in a very convoluted way, literally saving my life. These were, this was my first exposure to gay people, and I was thrilled uh, to be, in, but had to reconcile. I mean, people thought they were religious and so on, they're not, but they certainly were wanting a shiny new America. I ended up not going with the American troop because I couldn't quite handle that, but I ended up literally running off uh, with the European equivalent of up with people. Um, and I spent um, a year and a half on the road. Uh, I lived in 10 countries in Europe and North Africa and the United States, but most important, I got to be a lesbian. I got to live out my life, um, and it was a very exciting, nurturing way to take care of myself, to escape the conventions of the town that I lived in, and to be around gay people at a young age. So there was a kind of a conflict. I mean, I hear you talk about, you use the word escape. Uh, you describe yourself, in a sense, as your own guardian angel without self-consciousness. Mm -hmm. I don't mean, you mm -hmm. know, that this is a, a bad way to think, because mm -hmm. sometimes you do have to be your own big sister mm -hmm. or your own best friend. I've heard people describe mm -hmm. it, too. But the necessity for escape, it was really I know you sort of have said in the past you almost felt like you would, it, it, like your very life was threatened 
as though you would be squeezed to death by having to be someone that you weren't or by having to hide mm -hmm. who you really were, which is the experience mm -hmm. of a lot of us, I think, mm -hmm. before we're able to come out. And instead of coming out, you actually went somewhere geographically where you could mm -hmm. be yourself. It's true. I mean, it was also a sense that in being out, which inevitably, you know, I had to be. I mean, I, I absolutely could never, I was never one of the people that could um, reconcile trying to manage all of that, to live in the kind of imprisoned closet. Um, but I guess that uh, the way it felt is that also my spirit would be crushed. I mean, I just developmentally, I might have walked around and looked like a very successful teenager. A lot of gay people do. I mean, they look good. I mean, it's a kind of a classic. Um, it reminds me of adult children of alcoholic behavior. They look like they're succeeding. They're trying to hold it all together. But un, you know, underneath, just chip by little chip, they're being diminished. And I knew I had to get into a setting. Now, believe me, the authorities and up with people were not thrilled with my pride and how you know we were pretty robustly being gay and lesbian people within that troop. And, and it caused a lot of consternation. Um, but you should know that organization is chock full of gay people, always has been. The other people that were there with us is a lot of people escaping Vietnam mm -hmm. uh, in my troop. So it was very poignant. I remember sitting in Spa, Belgium, um, in a very vast, we, we, we learned how to sing and dance on a military base. Um, mm -hmm. And Nixon was resigning. Uh, they brought in a TV. So it was, a, it was in that time frame. Uh, and you know, I had tremendous experiences living with 60 or so different families um, over that period of time. And my one lesson um, is that there are gay people everywhere and, and, be, and generationally everywhere. If I could tell one very quick story, um, one time we were in a little town called Brezhna, Italy, and I was with a family and I had a host sister, that's what we would call them, named Gabriella. And I was flipping through a photo album of this, this family with Gabriella. And I spotted these old photographs from the 20s of these two women uh, that were roughhousing with each other. And I said, Gabriella, who are, the, who is the, who are these women? And she said, sort of in broken Italian, oh, that's my clunky old aunt. She lives up the road, you know. And Gabrielle was totally hip and loved to live in the disco. She was like a quintessential heterosexual teenager. And so we kept flipping, and I saw again these women together, and I just said, well, did your aunt ever get married? And she said, oh, yeah, she got married. And I said, oh. And she said, but it was during the war, and it was for less than a year, and she really never saw her husband after he went off to war. They broke up. And I said, oh. And I said, where's this other woman? And she says, well, she lives with my aunt <laughs> up the road. Uh -huh. So I arranged for my lover at the time and me to go and meet these two women. And I was so excited. And Gabriella, who had hoped for a very hip, you know, other teenager to go spend time with, was going, why does she want to go see my aunt? And to make a long story short, um, we made our way up this old apartment building in Italy and up to the door and these, this aunt and her friend had no idea why this kid from Canada wanted to meet them. And as soon as the door opened, um, I stood there with my lover and they looked down on these two kids and they, they just teared up mm -hmm. and they understood exactly why there was this drive to meet the two of them. And we spent the whole evening together. And Gabriella was going, why are you all crying? You know, it made no sense. Well, I think that's the thing about our, um, the, the, the joy that no one ever tells you about when you come out, when you meet other people, when you finally have the sense of feeling like you've come home. Um, mm -hmm. And you have family everywhere mm -hmm. because there's shared experience that you're not really allowed to think of. In almost every other minority, your family is part of that shared experience, mm -hmm. whether the experience is a negative or a positive or the, sort of the unification of it. Mm -hmm. We don't have that. Mm -hmm. and, but there are, you know, there's sort of more steps as we seek that. Mm -hmm. 
So you came back from Europe, and then what? I came back from Europe, I was madly in love, and I'd had the most romantic beginnings of my lesbian life. Um, my lover was from Hawaii, but we couldn't work out the immigration issues in Canada for mm -hmm. her to be there. We tried very hard. So then we ran away again um, to my par My parents stood on the sidewalk saying, you are not leaving. I mean, mm -hmm. screaming at me. And I just said, well, aloha. I mean, it was <laughs> very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and they, you know, and I think they just, they wanted the best for me. I was at University of Toronto. I was one of the best schools in the country. Um, but I left and, and made my escape again to, to uh, Hawaii. And I lived there for five years. And that's so. really where you became deeply involved in, in feminism. Yeah, I mean, the women's movement was then in, was, you know, in full gear. It was so fun. There were conferences and conventions around the country. And I spent a lot of time with the, uh, the you know, hanging out in the women's studies department. Um, even though, I, you know, you always see this, you always see these choices in my life. I mean, did a lot of women's studies, but it certainly wasn't my major, for example. Although I got sustenance from it. And uh, so I was involved <clears throat> in that way. Well, these parallel tracks that you talk about, it's interesting to me because a number of people follow an activist track, you know, from high school. Mm -hmm. And especially in that time frame. Other people I know follow, uh, you, I don't know, you call it the corporate or the more traditional track. Mm -hmm. You refer to it up until probably even late in, you know, in the, your life so far mm -hmm. as parallel tracks, not intersecting tracks. Mm -hmm. This. Um, sort of more traditional, successful, good student, um, going to professional school, and the kind of the activist part. Mm -hmm. What was it about women's studies that, that drew you? Well, women's studies itself was simply an excuse to get together with lesbians. I mean, that's the <laughs> truth, because frankly, I had read everything before. You know, most of the things we ended up actually studying and dissecting, um, you know, I had already read and, and loved and had a lot of passion about. I almost felt like the way in which it was, uh, you know, sort of put into a, a context and a structure within how to study it almost sort of sapped some of the spirit of it, even though I wholly think women's studies is essential for all women uh, and a lot of men, um, but not just lesbian women. So. Um, it really attracted me to get to be in the presence of other women studying important material. Uh, I loved all the activist um, activities around it as well. We did a lot of things on the campus. Um, we did a lot of things at conferences and conventions. You know, passionately passed resolutions on important issues affecting women. But even though I describe it as a parallel track, there is enormous cross-fertilization that occurred all the way along. And very frankly, um, it, I think that it's allowed me to make um, change occur in some very conventional settings. Um, and that change otherwise would not have occurred, at least in my life. I mean, Well, I know one of the referent points about that is, uh, is your work at Apple, but I want to kind of mm -hmm. get you through law school and to Apple, because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm interested in, in kind of in life decisions what was it that made you want to get the professional? I mean, is it just sort of you, you needed to be a professional? Or did you have something in mind really going to law school? Well, I had, you know, the same set of, you know, I had a very idealistic spirit, as do many, many young people that choose the law. And I think we have to look back a little bit at my childhood. I uniquely experienced my own country poking over a border. I mean, I observed it from afar. And it was more difficult to come out as someone that actually had this passionate admiration for the United States um, than it was to come out as a lesbian, uh, because this was the heyday of Canadian nationalism. And I was not a naive person. Um, I really understood the atrocities of American history, um, tenement housing in the Lower East Side in the late 19th century, slavery, I mean, the most painful scourge on this nation, um, blaming scapegoating immigrants in the 30s for disease, uh, the, the Japanese internment in World War II. I mean, 
I understood, um, you know, how awful America could be to its own at different junctures of history. But it was my view then, and it's my view today, that no country tries harder. I mean, it stumbles all over itself. Um, it's like this wayward teenager that has not quite grown up. Um, but I truly believe that in a real sense, no country, no nation has ever struggled so hard to preserve um, individual um, liberties. And so in going to law school, um, it was out of a deep, deep admiration for the American Constitution. And, you know, and it really explained why I wanted to be a part of a profession that hopefully would help to uphold that Constitution. Well, you know, it's interesting. We were talking yesterday about um, various influences on in our lives. And I, one of the things that is so clear to me, and it came out of a or was crystallized in David Garrow's new book, uh, Liberty and Sexuality, is that there are really three institutions that are, when you see them begin to shift in the way they respond to a concern, group, etc., that's the point at which you see public mm -hmm. uh, opinion start to shift. The religious institutions, the press, and the law, which is why I think there's such a struggle in Congress, in state legislatures, even in local school boards, mm -hmm. about who will make the rules and who will make the law. So mm -hmm. I very much understand mm -hmm. what you're saying. It's, we use the law to create slavery. We use the law to undo slavery. Mm -hmm. We use the law to put the Japanese into camps. We use the law to stop the camps. I mean, mm -hmm. it is, it's more than a double-edged sword. It is the most incredibly powerful tool. Mm -hmm. So, but... It, I was just going to, to to point out, not to be, you know, uh, this is not in any way gratuitous. It's why we absolutely need um, courageous and wise leaders and representatives. It's why we need you there. It's why we in in the California Assembly. It's why we need people who have the strength and courage to actually gamble with whether or not they get to return to that chair and so often representatives get into the chair um, you know they are so overwhelmed with the notion that they get to sit in the congress of the united states that i think at times in some cases they forget you know this the sacred duty that they have in terms of shepherding this nation well it's interesting the roles we each have at the moment i mean your current role which i want to get to but mm -hmm. not too fast because <laughs> i really do like the the, the journey mm -hmm. um, and the, sort of the articulation of it i think it's uh, wonderful uh, but the work that you do in impacting who's there and what they think and what kind of support they get while they are in Congress mm -hmm. or while they are uh, working in uh, mm -hmm. local or state government. Um, it's another choice to say, we think this is a very powerful place to be because mm -hmm. they do make the laws. But you didn't use your law degree right away for sort of movement stuff. I mean, there's still this I actually did. Oh, tell me. The, um, again, I mean, I did go in, and I, I was a complex commercial litigator, and so you can't get more conventional. I was very um, concerned that the antitrust laws get enforced appropriately and so on and so forth, securities law, that's what I did for a living. But immediately in embarking on my legal career, um, I was involved in very important pro bono work um, around uh, a number of issues, uh, including um, primarily AIDS and HIV, because when I graduated from law school, it was into that world of AIDS. Um, I was the founder of AIDS Legal Services, um, a program in Northern California. We trained um, dozens of lawyers to provide really solid services to people with HIV. But I worked on a number of pro bono issues, including what is called redlining in the insurance mm -hmm. industry, uh, which is to target zip codes where there might be um, high level of populations of gay men mm -hmm. uh, so that they could frankly write them out um, of the insurance history of the nation uh, to systematically deny insurance uh, to people, primarily gay men between certain age groups. I did a case involving um, the notion of the when someone recalls, and usually it's through therapy, that they have been molested as a child, and they have full-blown recall, 
that the statute of limitations not bar them, you know, from bringing a case against the perpetrator. Um, and there were a variety of issues. I worked on cases that were actually on my caseload um, to find the Marcos lost millions um, and get them back to the Aquino government. I was at a fantastic law firm um, that fully, McCutcheon, Doyle, Brown, and Enerson, we might as well give them credit, sure. that had become a little bit of a gay mecca in those years, in the mid-80s, and that really stepped up to the plate in terms of, uh, of its duty to, to give back to the community and, and allowed people like me um, to, to use the resources of that big firm um, to really give back uh, to the Northern California community. So I'm very grateful and, and, and I find that to be a life lesson over and over again. When you give the conventional institutions an opportunity, um, when you give mainstream America a chance, they'll probably fool you. Well, that's a perfect place for a break. Uh, we're going to take a very short break. Come back. Don't miss the second half. It gets even better. When you party, don't forget your safety net. Anti-German helmet and love gorge man of warship. French letter. Permission slip. Pig in a blanket. Ruby slipper. Rubbery thing in the Package. Condom. Yeah. Comedy Central, the most fun you can have without a condom. Hi, welcome back to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, your host, hostess, um, uh, narrator, moderator, whatever the heck the proper term is. And today we're very fortunate to be talking to Elizabeth Birch, who's the executive director of Human Rights Campaign in Washington. Um, welcome back and going forward, Elizabeth, what we were just talking about, you were talking about the pro bono work that you did. Mm -hmm. And before we talk about Apple, which I want to get to next, because you were talking about, you know, sort of give corporate America a shot, you might be surprised at uh, what the attitudes are. Mm -hmm. um, what was it that drove you to do pro bono stuff? I mean, I've been in law firms and some people do it and some people don't care at all. Well, I believe that it is uh, should be, and I think it is in California, an absolute requirement to do pro bono work because the institutions that you mentioned earlier, um, you know, when you look back into sort of the Middle Ages and coming out into the Renaissance and the Reformation, these are the shrouded, sacred, I mean, all the trappings of society. And with that flows enormous privilege. Um, who says the fair market value of a lawyer, you know, in corporate America should be sort of three or four hundred dollars an hour? I mean, that's an astounding thought. If you take a lawyer, put that person up beside, you know, a cafeteria worker, you know, some might say, boy, it's more important to me to get fed um, than to have this person um, advocating. I mean, it's, it's obviously an important service to society but there is an enormous amount of monetary reward that, that flows to that profession. And for that reason, I think in the institutions where that privilege is built in, it should be just built in as, as a professional requirement. Well, um, of course, and so much of it has to do with sort of the serving commerce. I mean, the enormous bulk of legal work mm -hmm. is really around serving commerce. And I think one of the most interesting things about your story is that you were enormously successful. I mean, you were chief litigator at Apple for... I was uh, director of litigation at Apple, and I was general counsel of Claris Corporation, the wholly owned software subsidiary of Apple. Right, we, you get their software built in to Apple. I, re I remember that, <laughs> having had one of the very first Macs under serial number 5000. Um, well, let's... Let's go to Apple. How did you mm -hmm. get there and decide to to work at uh, what became known, I guess, or always was a very forward-thinking mm -hmm. kind of firm, but not necessarily associated in any way with movement stuff or anything having to do with our movement, certainly. Well, I loved Apple. I had I watched Apple get. I watched birth happen. I knew in the early 80s that this was, you know, going to be one of the corporations where a unique set of values was going to be played out. And and I'll expand upon that in a moment. Um, 
I tried to go to Apple right out of law school. That's how much I loved the company and what they were doing. And well, any place whose address is on infinity loop, I'm sorry, I think that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, infinite loop. Yeah. The, um, what I saw happening, and I, I think I was right, um, when you look out at corporate America today, and it's part of this notion of uh, at least opening up your mind and giving conventional institutions a chance beyond any other sector, any other institution in America today, and I mean the traditional conventional institutions that you look to, to, to kind of chronicle and monitor change, corporate America is way ahead of Congress and way ahead of other institutions on the issue of, of gay and lesbian civil rights. And about half of the Fortune 1000 have already instituted non-discrimination policies. A number of them, including, you know, the Disney company, Kodak last week, um, have instituted domestic partner coverage. Quaker Oats, Johnson & Johnson um, just instituted non-discrimination policies. Coca-Cola this week. This is fascinating behavior. And but this isn't really, a lot of people think this is a top-down thing. Like the CEO one morning mm -hmm. wakes up and goes, oh, queers, I love them. And they're all through my company. I'm just sure of it, though I haven't met one. I'm going to put in a domestic partnership policy. Not. I mean, right. for instance, what happened to Scully at Apple? Well, uh, what happened to, to well, let me describe the anatomy of the process because nothing happens top down. Nothing. You know, those institutions that you mentioned, uh, religion, Cong uh, the law, and the, and the press, none of it happens uh, without person to person, brick by brick change. Um, we sometimes call it grassroots organizing. It goes by many names. But what it really is doing is it's changing the underbelly of an institution so it can pop out the top and hopefully be a fair-minded progressive stance on an issue. Um, really, all, all that happened to John Scully at Apple is he was given an opportunity to do the right thing. There had been and I only use Apple by way of example, by the way, because dozens of corporations have gone through the exact same series of events. Um, there was the grassroots component, Apple Lambda, very essential organization, gay and lesbian employee group, that got formed at Apple by a man named Bennett Marks. And they went about the business of getting a non-discrimination policy, went on to, uh, to advocate for domestic partnership, and what happens inevitably in corporations is it sort of is uh, everyone picks the right route to sort of start to advocate and to escalate the issue. And often it ends up rattling around inside the human resources department or the multicultural department. And often no one really wants to take the risk out of these whatever department the employee group might select to go and advocate to the CEO and with a whole heart and a good, you know, solid um, conviction about it. And also, there's always looming out there the board of directors and all of the customers of the corporation. And so what I always tell employee groups is, don't forget the CEO. The CEO usually got that position because he or she is a risk taker inevitably, in some way, shape, or form, they lived through the 1960s and something got stamped into their DNA. And again, it might surprise you that if the case is put forward directly with the CEO sitting right in front of you, um, often they will, you know, simply say, this makes complete sense. It costs, it's de minimis, the cost of implementing, implementing domestic partner coverage. So the slightly more, um, uh, a slightly older 12-year-old baby dyke who was so certain of herself and was proud of being a lesbian, is that the person who talked to Scully? Yeah, but yes, and also, frankly, an executive that cared very, very deeply about this company. I could not stay at a company that was going to trade on a progressive image and not deliver to their own employees something that is so fundamentally um, easy to implement. Now at the same time were you also doing work in what uh, I guess people would call more traditional activist circles. I mean I know that you were one of the founders of 
BAMEC, which is a like a gather up money and give it to candidates group in Northern California. Yes. Right. The Bay Area Municipal Elections Committee, I actually wasn't a founder. I was on the board uh -huh. and um, helped to do some of a lot of their development work and to really launch them into sort of much in, in, into bigger amounts of money. Um, very strategic organization and, and sort of the sister organization of a num you know, they were all, remember, they were all sprinkled. Sure. Mecla and right. there were a number of them in California. And I was also on the board of um, and very um, active in the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. Now that's an interesting combination because the task force for years, um, I think I probably first became aware when uh, Irvishi was the ED of the task force, had a reputation mm -hmm. of being very, very grassroots, very PC, very radical in a sense, and in the sense that people use the term about me, which means you believe in the right things as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Um, and here you are, you're, you know, you're a corporate lawyer, mm -hmm. but you're on the board of the task force and eventually the co-president or co-chair of the task force. Right. How did that come about? Well, it was interesting. I was basically harassed for so long by the task force to come on the board that frankly to stop it I thought okay I'll go to a board meeting. <laughs> and I fell in love with the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force but I was always the lone corporate wolf. Despite all the rhetoric, the actual work of the task force in those years um, was quite conventional. I mean, look at what they were trying to do. Pass a gay civil rights law. Well, you know, they weren't trying to overthrow the government. They were lobbying in the Congress of the United States. They developed one of the cutting edge violence programs um, in this nation. The work of Kevin Barrow was second to none. Um, back in those days, I loved the kind of intellectual roots of NGLTF. And um, I felt that I could bring a way of thinking strategically. And frankly, I think I did bring, you know, lots of resources to the task force. Um, I think that though ultimately it is, it is a, a left organization and, and in a way, um, you know, the river wants to go to Mombasa, you have to let it go. Mm -hmm. um, I had dreamed of uh, a, a little bit more centrist approach, um, but the task force is a vital voice, I think, for the left and we've got to have that voice. Um, I ended people up... people see... I'm sorry. Well, I ended up actually choosing an organization that um, did business a little differently and, and, and not so in touch with the grassroots, and I think it needed change. And so I ended up going uh, to the Human Rights Campaign Fund at that time. Um, and hopefully, we've been able to commingle some of the organic activism with, with pretty corporate marketing and communications approaches. And I think, I hope, and it's reflected that we've brought about um, I think some vital uh, success and, and, and very explosive growth. Well, I had a, a, a sort of a chuckle response when I heard that you were going from being co-chair of the task force to being the ED of HRC, mm -hmm. because in the way that people who are involved in neither and probably not involved in much else mm -hmm. try to set them up as competitors, like in a movement you can only have one group doing something when God knows we need everybody doing everything. Uh, you were, in a way, and I think I see now that you have before, um, carrying a kind of dust on your shoes from one place to another so that, I mean, you have a toolbox. You have an activist toolbox, tools in the toolbox. You have the, you call them corporate or traditional or just, you know, the, the tools that the majority of America seems to value in that toolbox. And wherever you are, it's almost like you say, what don't they have here that I've got? Uh, tinker a little bit. Now, what don't they have here that I've got? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's very valuable that you're at uh, Human Rights Campaign. Um, and I think it would be good for us to understand a little bit about at this moment in our history, at the last two uh, breaths of the 20th century or whatever, what, what is the role of a national organization like HRC? What, what is it? What should it be? And I think most especially, what can it be? Well, I saw the, the Human Rights Campaign Fund, and we changed the name during my first year to Human Rights Campaign. And really, it's a human rights campaign f for gay and lesbian Americans. Um, 
it began as a, and, and I'm going to put this in context, but it began as a, as a PAC, a political action committee in the early 80s. It had developed a very quack lobbying team, hi, highly intelligent and effective. But what was missing was the notion of a field. And the gay and lesbian movement has never, in, for the purposes of defending ourselves, protecting ourselves at the national level, um, and to strategically, proactively pass some protection at the national level. We have never systematically built a field. We have incredible, robust organizations locally, like the most premier um, Los Angeles uh, Gay and Lesbian Community Center. Um, but the center can't, it may now, I mean, it'll be able to be very effective because there's a new network um, of community centers around the nation. That'll be an essential tool. But we've never systematically connected the dots. Now, we're very balkanized as a movement, and we have a chance to move forward into a new era of connectedness and, I hope, wisdom and maturity to try to engage trust as a vehicle so at the Human Rights Campaign, first of all, we've changed, we've augmented a lot of our activities with a lot more community activities, community-based events and activities. We've also tried to communicate all the battles. The result is very immediate. We've seen a doubling of the membership in one year, and it's unabated, it's still growing. We need all of those voices. We've also launched a partner program to specifically, in a formal way, partner with statewide organizations. We've done this, we've launched Minnesota and Georgia so far, but you'll see a number of them coming on board this year, where we actually invest money in like a joint venture. We work together and that builds the trust so that when they turn around and want to do statewide work, there is an infrastructure there. There's, they can use all of our membership, we use theirs, it's collaborative, and we win together. Um, in terms of, you know, as we look, just, you know, the, the turn of the century is just a stone's throw away. And I'll tell you, it's both terrifying and hopeful what is happening in America. As I've said many, many times, you cannot find a pole that will give you less than 70% of the nation that says they don't want to see this group of Americans hurt um, or discriminated against. Um, it's 74%, and it's the majorities of Republicans, Democrats, and Independents, which is surprising. The other thing that's happening in America right now, and we've seen this front and center in this 96 election, is that it's gone way beyond Pat Buchanan, who's a walking hate crime. They're actually having small microcosm Nuremberg type rallies in places like Iowa around anti-gay marriage. And of course gay people should be able to marry, but that's not why they're doing it. They have found an incredible scapegoat and they're building on the hate that got thrown around the Republican convention in 92, and we see it unleashed tenfold at this point. I think it's a complete miscalculation of where this nation is. I think it's wrong-headed. I think it's mean-spirited and cruel. I think it'll fail, and it'll bring the Republican Party down. Um, but it's hard to hang on to hope, and gay people must remain engaged in the political system overcome disappointment that gets layered on us every once in a while, um, and understand that the rhetoric from the Republican Party, the candidates for president, does not represent America. It is not where most Americans are. And it's hard to remember that. It's hard to hang on to that hope. Well, it seems to me part of the strategy of the right is not only to build up and engage that very powerful uh, emotion, which is really sort of hate or directed hate in one segment of the population, but to also develop a kind of hopelessness in us. I mean, I see good people bailing from Congress oh, because yes. they themselves no longer see the efficacy of their work. They're used to having at least a few wins, and they see this, and I see the same thing in Sacramento. There's a sense that you, you must go home 
and you know do what Holly Hunter did in Network News, take the phone off the hook and cry for 15 <laughs> minutes, put the phone back off the hook and get back to work. In broadcast news. Broadcast yeah. news, that was it. And that's part of the strategy. So I'm really glad to hear you talk about combating hopelessness because God knows as gays we're hopeless enough to begin with anyway. You have to overcome self-hatred, then you have to overcome your, the imagined or real hatred from you know, your own intimates and your friends when you come out and then you, you worry at every step of the way, will they not love me, will they not love me, will they not love me? Mm -hmm. And so our own community becomes so much more important but our own sense that we will prevail Mm -hmm. I mean, remember that they didn't allow slaves to marry. And after the emancipation, they still didn't allow interracial marriage. Even though people said, now we will not do discrimination anymore. We'll have the 14th Amendment, 13th, 14th, and 15th. We will not discriminate. We still don't want them to marry us. I mean, it was a joke all the way up to guess who's coming to dinner or, and beyond, mm -hmm. you know. So I see that we are just, in a sense, where we can be historically moving through what is essentially the newest or one of the newest movements you know in our track and it just takes more time than people think but our movement seems to be very much in a hurry loses heart up oh, gays in the military didn't win it's over for me I, I'm not quite sure why we're in such a hurry I think that one of the most instructive things that people can do um, is to read uh, Parting the Waters by Taylor Branch to understand the real dissection of the civil rights movement in this country for African Americans. And there was, it was a long, long journey. And there was infighting and there were factions. And, you know, it wasn't clear Martin Luther King would be the anointed spokesperson. Um, and it was, and, and one thing that that movement did that I think we can learn from is it was rooted in a kind of spirituality that was not to be denied. Um, but we are on a long journey, and I just, I worry about things like the marriage issue in the sense that we passionately want the choices that all free citizens um, get in this nation. And some things will come sooner than others. We've, we will see protections in the workplace coming quite soon. Uh, we're going to see the Hawaii marriage decision hit this nation like a tsunami. But I believe what it will trip off is actually a number of sacred battles at the state level, and those battles will go on for some time. Uh, I don't think we're going to just see silv silver wedding bells everywhere. Uh, it's simply another chapter um, in our struggle. But I love um, 100 Years of Solitude uh, when you know the lead character turns uh, to another one in, in the struggle and says, what will happen if we really slay the dragon? Um, we won't get to do this work anymore. And there's a part of me that thinks, um, what a gift to be able to be engaged in this work with each other. To have that experience like when I got to see these two aged Italian women in their 70s, they had lived through Mussolini um, and they had found each other and they eked out a way um, to celebrate whatever level of intimacy uh, was in that relationship. So there is no doubt in my mind that to be gay or lesbian is an absolute um, gift from God and or the goddess or whatever we're in California, whatever is your higher power. <laughs> and or your oversoul, that's my new one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Um, and, you know, th th there is something incredible about the journey that we're on. I mean, it's a gift as well. Well, part of the gift, too, is the gift of the outsider. Um, that's, uh, it's occurred to me in more than one interview that the people who accept early on the fact that they are, quote, different and celebrate it mm -hmm. um, in a society that doesn't, in a society that really wants you to conform, and especially young people's own society in schools that makes them want to and need to conform, that where there is a celebration of this difference, there is such capacity to dream a world that doesn't exist or can exist, not yet, kind of thing. And I think that's the gift, or one of the gifts in our community. Um, in essence, we've also learned a, a kind of a terrible lesson with AIDS. 
where we have had to care for our own, uh, think up all the solutions uh, often outside of uh, the traditional governmental solutions, and deal with death at such a young age that we've also, there's a spiritual quality to it that you wouldn't have chosen, you know, it's a, it, but, it, but it is a response that's transformed our community. And I see that we are teachers as well as struggling and learning on our own how to be a movement that often, as an example, we teach. I mean, I know that when, when we come out to our family, sometimes other family secrets then can be spoken. Uh, it doesn't even have to be about being gay or lesbian. They won't just tell you about your aunt who was or whatever, but the, another kind of secret that no one could talk about, that the honesty of our movement um, also is exemplary in a way. And I'm not sure whether um, that sounds right to you, but it, I just... It sounds perfectly right. I was talking to, um, there's a group from, I was in Boston uh, the other day, and there's a group that's going to do a study of the workplace behavior of, of these gay employee groups and why corporations adopt protections. And we were, you know, formulating what that study would look like. And one of the things I've observed is that, and, and when I say workplace, I mean all workplaces. I mean little bakeries and, you know, the people that are brave. I mean, you know, Helen in the middle of Iowa, who, who might be a lesbian, you know, in some small town and takes a stand. But I believe what's going on is that gay people are leading. And what they do is by leading, because they are the most controversial, they are the most, um, the ones that it is sort of major risk to be on the front lines, they make room for other employee groups. So I think there's a parallel to what happens um, in families. Uh, well, given our, um, hopefully, long life expectancy, <laughs> you can't even be halfway through yours. Um, what do you see for yourself in the future? Uh, I want to leave behind at the Human Rights Campaign. I mean, we are on such a, an, a major growth path. I want to leave behind all of the tools uh, for the next century. And one of the things I'm enormously excited about is uh, that for the first time uh, in a conventional electoral legislative sense, we're going to find uh, 26 of the most talented young gay leaders in this nation and train them. Very high-end campaign training. Uh, we're going to be doing an uh, incredible uh, HRC convention this summer, a gay convention uh, in between the Republican and Democratic convention. <laughs> so frankly, we can take back the mainstream um, electoral system and celebrate it and grab it and try to return a fair-minded Congress. Um, so I hope to leave behind um, all of the right ingredients so that we can continue to be very uh, goal-oriented, focused to, to bring some real deliverables. I mean, I do turn corporate when I, when I talk about how I think we need to think about um, moving forward. Um, so I hope to leave all that in place. And then I'm not sure. I mean, I think it could go in one direction or the other. Uh, I think it would be very fun uh, to have my own company with my new little dream team. I mean, I've been able to attract not just some of the best gay talent in the country, but some of the best talent um, of our era. I mean, I truly believe of this century from Silicon Valley um, into the human rights campaign with me. One person is Susan Schumann, one of the best marketeers Apple ever had. I mean, she's a wireless specialist. Everything, how all that magic floats around on your cell phone, <laughs> she knows how that works. Uh -huh. um, and she's just an amazing manager. I mean, she's come in as number two to help run the place day to day. This is incredible talent. And I think when we build, I hope, a magnificent legacy, um, we can move on and maybe do um, some great high-tech innovation but have our own gay-focused company. You know, a little gay Ben and Jerry's or something, <laughs> a la high tech something. Uh -huh. But I'm not sure what that looks like. I may go the route of some kind of public service, or I may do law. Uh, I haven't, you know, figured it out. I kind of work in four or five year increments, and the next stage doesn't tend to emerge until the last couple of years, a year or two. 
you know, uh, of each stage. So I've only done one of the five-year plan at this point. Well, um, as a person who I think is in my seventh career, as mm -hmm. others would, you know, it's you sh just decide what three things or four things or twenty things mm -hmm. sound interesting, and instead of choosing among them, you just choose which you'll do first and right. which you'll do next. Because the interesting thing is people say, oh no, you know, an opportunity will come up and you have to grab it. Well, it is true. In an mm -hmm. era of term limits in California, for instance, when my predecessor decided not to run, that was a good time to run because I didn't have to run against an incumbent. Mm -hmm. But still, who knows that I couldn't have done that in 20 years and, you know, done something else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I want to have children. I mean, oh, here we are in the last minute of the show and we're coming suddenly into the personal <laughs> stuff. Well, well that, that will, I mean, I don't want to leave this planet without having, um, you know, been able to nurture children. I love children, so stay tuned for that as well. <laughs> well, I think that uh, this, is, this has been a wonderful hour. I, don't, I can't believe it's gone by so fast, and I'm really, really grateful that you were here. Uh, it was a great twist of fate that you were uh, in town for the big dinner. And um, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Sheila. If you had one lesson that you have learned that you would share with uh, the thousands of folks watching around mm -hmm. the country, what would, what would you say to them? Come out. You know, we must come out and trust the heart of the person you're coming out to. Um, even if they're uh, thrown off, agitated, shocked, which frankly is a very rare reaction, um, trust that in most cases, Rob Eichberg sort of chronic chronicled this, and I'm, I'm so sorry he's gone from our earth. Um, he said that sort of in most cases, well over 90% of families, um, you know, they come out the other side and they embrace their child, so come out. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, and we'll see you next month, next week, tomorrow, whatever it is. Get used to it.